My name is Dick Miller. I uh, direct the program in Ethics of Public Life in the Philosophy Department. This is the fifth talk in the Ethics of Public Life series, After the American Century, Fears and Hopes for America's Future. And it has become very clear what the great fear is. The great fear is that high unemployment will be the new normal for Americans in this century, and that good, secure jobs will no longer be a standard expectation in the United States. To address this fear, we need an economist who is eminent and also humane, someone who has been an adventurous, insightful inquirer into the economics of employment, of wages, of work, and who hasn't just inquired, ideally who also knows what it's like to influence public policy. In short, we need Lisa Lynch, our speaker today. Uh, Ron Ehrenberg of the Cornell Economics Department will introduce her, and then she will talk to us on the ongoing employment crisis. What will it take to recover? Lynch is the Dean and the Maurice B. Texel Professor of Social and Economic Policy at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University. She's a very distinguished labor economist with a long publication record. Uh, she is currently a member of the Governor's Council of Economic Advisors for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, a member of the National Academy's uh, Committee on National Statistics, and president of LIRA, the Labor and Employment Relations Association. Uh, last year, uh, she was selected as a LIRA fellow uh, for her exceptional contributions to research in labor and employment relations. And LIRA only chooses two or three academic fellows a year, and typically they're much more senior and engaged than Lisa is. From 1995 to 1997, uh, she was the Chief Economist at the U.S. Department of Labor. From 2004 to 2009, she was a member of the Board of Directors of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, rising to the role of first deputy chair and then chair in 2007 and 2009. And she also served as chair of the conference of chairs of the Federal Reserve System in 2009. Uh, she is a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, the Economic uh, Policy uh, Institute, and at IZA, uh, which is in Germany. Before coming to Brandeis, she served as a faculty member uh, at uh, Tufts, MIT, Ohio State, and the University of Bristol. And she received her BA in Economics and Political Science from uh, Wellesley and her MS and PhD from the London School of Economics. Uh, most important, I, uh, I want to stress to you that like fellow labor economist Richard Freeman, who preceded her in this series, uh, and like uh, all of the labor economists uh, at Cornell, she is an extremely nice person. <laughs> and, and because of that, uh, we are very, very lucky to have her here with us uh, at Cornell this week. Please. Thank you, Ron. I'm glad to hear you still think I'm nice uh, after all these years. Um, so uh, it's a real treat uh, to be here at, at Cornell. Before, before I'm going to start my uh, talk, I just sort of share a little uh, personal moment uh, for you. So in uh, 1974, uh, I was a high school student in Amherst, New York, it's a suburb of Buffalo. Um, I was uh, there, my father was working for Anaconda American Brass uh, that had huge uh, uh, mills in, in uh, rolling mills in, in Buffalo. And I was trying to decide what I wanted to do in terms of college. 
And the ILR school here uh, was one of my top choices. I also had a secret desire to be a professional music musician, which my parents were not too thrilled about because uh, they were con concerned that I wouldn't actually um, find any kind of a living with that, and they were probably right. Um, but I remember coming here to the ILR school in 1974, looking at the school and thinking, wow, this would be really cool to be here and maybe I become a labor organizer when I finish my uh, undergraduate degree at Cornell. Um, Wellesley uh, made a better deal in terms of the finances and I ended up going to Wellesley, but it's fun for me every time I come back onto this campus because I just remember at that age of 18 and thinking about issues of industrial relations and at that stage deindustrialization in particular, which was front and center in my own family as um, uh, my father was losing, uh, losing employment. Um, I, I think of the long tradition here of uh, studying in labor and industrial relations and preparing um, individuals to kind of advance that field. It's a long tradition and one that I hope goes on for a long time. So that's my, it's a little introduction there and pitch. And if anybody ever tries to get rid of the ILR school, I'm ready to, you know, organize a picket and, and, and man the barricades. So um, the title of my talk today is The Ongoing Employment Crisis, What Will It Take uh, to Recover? And I think maybe the best way to set up this talk is just to um, sort of summarize where we are, so the nature of the employment crisis. So we've had this dramatic increase in unemployment, uh, unemployment rate uh, getting uh, double digits uh, in terms of unemployment in the United States. We have over 40 million people needing food support. Many people have lost their homes. They're unable to find uh, housing. Uh, even if, because it's not affordable, and we see rising inequality. We have uh, wages that have stagnated, and we've got uh, bipartisan calls uh, to support uh, job creation. It's probably the only thing that Congress can agree on right now is everybody wants more jobs. They have different strategies how you get there, but they all want more jobs. And you know, we want to restore growth in our economy. But at the same time, we hear employers saying, well, you know, I did have high uh, labor standards, but I can't really maintain those labor standards um, because I've got cutthroat competition that's, that is exploiting labor, and so I need to do the same in order to survive. We have um, prosperity, you know, people arguing that prosperity depends on the genius of American business. But businesses are faced with multiple government mandates and regulations, and these regulations are hampering job growth. And we have a Supreme Court headed by Justice Roberts um, that's viewed as unsupportive of labor. So that's sort of the scene that we have. So what might we do? Well, that was actually the scene in 1938. Interesting enough, the Supreme Court was headed by a Justice Roberts. And um, all of those characteristics that I talked about were the characteristics of the US economy at that period of time. And so what happened in 1938? We had the passage of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Certainly coming to Cornell, one cannot not mention Frances Perkins. And the only woman that's in this picture is, in fact, Frances Perkins. Uh, Secretary of Labor. She was the first woman in um, cabinet um, uh, secretary. She served as Secretary of Labor from 1933 to 1945. And then she did the most important job, which was to be a professor here at Cornell University. Um, but uh, Frances Perkins was quite extraordinary as a labor secretary and well known for having many ideas in her drawer of her desk. Um, about how to improve um, conditions of, of, uh, of work and to raise standards of, of living for, for individuals. So, you know, as this quote says, the authors of uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act believed that its primary objective was to eliminate uh, labor conditions detrimental to the maintenance of the minimum standard of living necessary for health, efficiency, and general well-being of workers without substantially curtailing employment <coughs> or earning uh, power. Um, and this was one of uh, many acts that was passed at that time to address the employment crisis uh, of the Great uh, Depression. So as I think about um, 
the nature of the employment crisis today, I think in my head, well, what would Francis Perkins be telling us that we need to do? What would Francis Perkins be saying that we should be doing uh, to address this employment crisis? Um, so let me now actually give you the real data about this, this current uh, Great Recession, some of the characteristics of it. And um, understanding those characteristics, I think, helps um, shape at least some of the ideas that we might have for how to address it. So um, we've had the United States going through this you know, incredibly long um, and very deep recession, the deepest since the Great Depression. It was officially started in December of 2007 and then deemed to be over in June 2009. Now, this is done by the National Bureau of Economic Research, does the dating of the start and ending of a, a recession. And primarily, but not exclusively, what they're looking for is changes in output, the amount of stuff that's produced um, uh, in the United States. Is that contracting? Then it's a recession. If it's growing, then you're into uh, a recovery. Now, during the height of the recession, we had the economy contracting at over 8%. Uh, a year. So in the fourth quarter of 2008, the economy was contracting at an annual rate of 8%. So a whole slew of emergency measures were put in place to try to address um, uh, this contraction. You had TARP, which was uh, signed into law by George Bush, a Republican president, to authorize uh, up to $700 billion to purchase assets and equity from financial institutions to strengthen the financial sector. Um, you had um, the federal stimulus uh, bill signed into law in February of 2009 by President Obama um, that authorized uh, 800, over $800 billion to be paid out in federal uh, stimulus. Note at the same time that the federal government was throwing in to the economy 800 billion, state and local governments contracted their spending by about 300 billion. So net, we had about 500 billion added into the economy. Federal Reserve was in big time on this and I had um, the privilege and the anxiety of having sort of a front row seat um, in the actions that the Federal Reserve uh, undertook. The balance sheet of the Federal Reserve increased from $800 billion in 2007 to now, I think it's over $3.7 trillion. So a ton of money that was thrown into the economy to try to address this uh, considerable contraction uh, that we saw. And so you see, you know, these red bars, you see the, uh, when TARP came in and then the 2009 stimulus came in, the economy was really on, you know, contracting significantly, and then we start seeing a recovery. What's interesting when you look at this recovery, and I think of some worry when you look, say, at the last three quarters or four or five quarters of the U.S., recovery hasn't been consistent. So we had a deep recession, but we haven't seen a sort of sharp, solid uh, recovery coming out of this. It's been a bit um, er erratic. And I think when people talk about some of the anxiety associated with the recovery, uh, part of that has to do with the fact that as we've come back, it's been a bit choppy, and uh, we seem to lurch from one political crisis to another that just sort of adds on to the um, anxiety. In terms of what happened to uh, jobs, uh, employment is what we call lagging ind indicator. So as the economy contracts in terms of output, we see contractions in employment happening a bit later. Employers don't shed labor uh, immediately. And then as the, uh, um, the economy starts adding output, we don't see uh, job growth uh, following instantaneously. It, it tends to come in with a lag. But here again, you see the, the red lines are the areas of job uh, contraction. It's sort of the height of employment contraction uh, in uh, 2009, we were losing over 800,000 jobs a month in, in the U.S. economy. There's a little area where we see a big spike up in 2010. That's that area that uh, has a circle uh, around it. That was a lot of government hiring associated with the decennial census. And then they laid everybody off um, after the uh, census. And those, so since, you know, basically um, the end of 2010, we've started to have uh, monthly positive uh, job growth. 
where you know currently um, uh, we're averaging about 185,000 jobs uh, added to uh, the economy. That's the sort of 12-month average as of September of this year. In the month of September itself, we added 148,000 uh, new jobs uh, to the economy. But we're still 2 million jobs below the peak employment number that we had before going into the recession, the peak employment in 2007. And meanwhile, our population has been growing. So all in, to keep pace with a growing population and to recover the two, this two million jobs that we're still in the hole on for, for the contraction since 2007, we need about eight million net new jobs added to the economy to get back to where we were. Well, when you're only adding 148,000 or 185,000 jobs a, a month, it's gonna take a long time before you get uh, back to something that looks like uh, full employment. But the monthly um, addition of, of jobs is pretty consistent with that earlier chart that sort of showed a GDP kind of clunking around, you know, most recently between one and two percent. And so we're gonna see job growth numbers of around 150 to 200,000 when we have um, uh, GDP growing at that rate. So what we really need is to see GDP growing at three to four percent and employment numbers of 250 to 350,000 net new jobs a month to really um, make some sort of a dent into the pool of, of unemployment. Now the overall unemployment rate peaked in October of 2009 at, at 10% in the United States. Um, and that was really almost a post-war high. We had higher unemployment rates back in the 1980s, in the early 80s, in the recession at that period of time. Um, if you look at the most recent unemployment rate, it was at 7.2%, or I actually like to talk about the numbers of people, it was over 11 million people that were out of work, officially out of work in September of 2013. And what's interesting when you look at the um, pattern of unemployment. Here we've got uh, male and female um, unemployment rates. The blue line uh, is for men, the red line is for women. Apologies for gender stereotyping with those color choices. Um, but you see that, you know, usually over the course, and this is going back to 1980, we see um, unemployment rates for men and women moving similarly together. Men's tend to go up a, a wee bit higher in the peak of a recession than, than women's. But what's um, notable about the most recent recession is that we see a much higher uh, increase in unemployment rates for men. Over 11% the male unemployment rate uh, reached, whereas female unemployment reached a max of about uh, 9%. And um, you know, some people as a result of this much higher increase in the unemployment rate for men have referred to the most recent recession as the man session. Uh, and a lot of that had to do with the fact that with housing contraction and disproportionately high fraction of workers in the construction industry being men, that you saw um, that big uptick in, in unemployment for, for men. What's interesting is that looking at the recovery, you see that the rate for men has been dropping at a faster rate than the rate for, of unemployment for women. So some people have taken to calling this the he recovery. Um, so issues of gender are kind of interesting in thinking about who's taking the, the burden of this recession. My own view is these rates are really high for men and women. So uh, families and um, households are taking the hit with respect to um, this recession. So let's look a little bit at what happened uh, what's happened to unemployment rates by different types of demographic uh, groups. So one of the things that has been quite striking about um, this recession and actually echoes a lot of what we saw in the recession in the early 1980s is that there's been a big increase in the unemployment rate for, for youth. Now youth tend to have much higher unemployment rates than adults anyways. So if you look at um, youth age 16 to 19 in 2007, so before the recession started, their unemployment rates were about 16%. Today, they're a little over 20%. They reached a high of over 25%, so one in four uh, young people uh, out of work. 
For those of you who are in the 20 to 24 year old um, age category, you'll see that um, that rate is, is elevated as well. It's uh, currently um, about 13% uh, for 20 to 24 year olds. And then you see uh, whites have lower rates, black um, unemployment rates, still double digit unemployment rates, Hispanic a bit lower, Asian uh, lower. So there's variation in the unemployment rates by uh, different demographic uh, groups, with youth really taking um, a, a, a very high, a high uh, fraction of youth who are in the labor market having very high um, unemployment rates, and black unemployment still remaining double digit, even now, September, or sorry, in um, November of uh, 2013, the data that we have only refers back to September 2013, but we still have du double digit uh, unemployment uh, for, for blacks in, in the United States. Unemployment varies by education. The good news for all of you who are in college, better to be in college uh, than to be less than a high school uh, degree uh, person in the labor market. So we still have, uh, for those with less than a high school degree, double digit unemployment over 10%. Again, their unemployment rates were higher before the recession, but what's happened with a recession is everybody's unemployment rate um, has risen. So I think that's one of the things to take away with the, the characteristics of this um, recession. Initially, because of the contraction in the housing market, we saw the um, major contraction in male employment in the construction industry, but as the recession played out, given the depth of the recession, there was really um, only one sector of the economy that did not experience employment contraction. That was the healthcare and education section of the economy. All other sectors of the economy experienced um, employment contraction. And by demographic groups, all demographic groups experienced higher unemployment. So no one was immune from the, the effect of this recession. So I think that's why everybody knows somebody who either lost a job, um, or has reduced hours, um, uh, and it's either in your immediate family, a neighbor, friend, or, your, or yourself. So everyone has been um, impacted by uh, this recession. Having said that, it is true that the groups that have been hit disproportionately in this recession are the same groups that were hit disproportionately in the last recession, and the recession before that, and the recession before that. So if you're young, you're unskilled, and you're um, a minority, you have a much higher probability of being unemployed. Um, and that has remained true for over 30 years. So as a society, when we're thinking about what progress we have or haven't made um, uh, for different groups in our society, you know, that reality hasn't really changed over, over the 30 years. The nature of this recession was much de deeper, but who was um, having the hardest time with it, that sort of stayed, uh, stayed the same. So let's talk about some features of this recession, though, that are a little different from um, past, uh, past recessions. Um, so here are, this is a little funky to, to read. I don't know about, about the lighting, but this is just sort of, um, Looking at the percent change in non-farm payroll, that's sort of the employment number you get every, every uh, month at the first Friday of the month, since the start of the recession. And it's mapping out um, uh, the 1981-82 recession, that's the blue line. Then the 1991 recession, the sort of modest recession of 2001, and then the most recent recession in red for 2007 to uh, 2009. So you see, so you basically, the way to read this is like, how long did it take me before I got back to positive employment? When, when do I go across this zero line that's going across? So in the recession in the early 19. Uh, 80s took little, a little more than two years for the economy to recover in terms of the job uh, jobs number, uh, the contraction that um, it experienced, and that was a pretty uh, deep uh, recession. Remember, I told you the unemployment rate in the 80s got to a point even higher than in the most recent recession we've been in. In the recession of 1990-91, it took about um, two and a half years to fully recover, even though the the depth of that recession wasn't as great as the 80s. 
in the recession of 2001, it took four years to get back to the employment level that you had at the beginning of the recession. And in the current recession, here we are, we're approaching six years. That'll be in December of this year. And we still haven't recovered all the jobs that have been lost. So there seems to be, it's taking more and more time for the economy to recoup uh, jobs that get lost during a recession. So uh, even before this current recession, people were saying, gee, why is it that it's taking so much more time for uh, the economy to um, add jobs? What's changing in the nature of employment in the United States? Is there something structural that's going on or some changes in institutions? Is it, I know Richard Freeman talked to you about, you know, is it globalization? Is it technology? Is it demography? What's, what's um, uh, happening uh, here? But um, what's important when you look at this red line um, and you're thinking about um, some of the public policy uh, debates and discussions that we have. Um, with, we're still not fully recovered in terms of, uh, of employment. And so you have places like the Federal Reserve, the chairman of the Federal Reserve saying, and the, the um, Federal Open Market Committee, saying that unless the pace of economic growth and job creation picks up dramatically, um, they're going to continue in accommodating monetary policy. Um, and continuing to add uh, stimulus into the economy because they have a dual mandate of both keeping inflation low and employment at full employment uh, levels. And in fact, the Fed, for the first time, and this is, this is a, a, a new feature of uh, monetary policy, has actually announced that it's going to keep interest rates low until the unemployment rate gets back down to 6.5%. So just to flag for you, it's currently at 7.2%, um, and they're going to keep this accommodative uh, policy until unemployment drops down to 6.5. Probably not something that we'll see uh, until the end of 2014, beginning of 2015. And I have to say, people have been saying the unemployment rate was going to get down to some lower level. Every year they keep pushing out the forecast. It always gets pushed out farther and, and farther. Now, the Fed target of this, I don't know why this isn't going, um, unemployment rate of 6.5%, that's the official unemployment rate, which is the number of people that say that they're out of work but have looked for work over the course of the last four <coughs> weeks. So it doesn't take into account people that have lost their job um, but are maybe working in a community where uh, there was a, just a few employers in town, they're all shuttered and they've stopped looking for work because they know that there's not anything available for them. Maybe they're sitting in a house that is still underwater in terms of their mortgage, they're not moving, or that's where their family and networks are, they don't want to move, and they've, they're waiting for something to come back into their community. Those are called discouraged workers. We, we capture them in, in uh, data that are collected in the U.S., um, but they're not included in the official unemployment rate. And for people who are working, uh, not everyone is working all the hours that they would like to work. So there's a question that's asked in the monthly survey that asks folks, well, yes, you say you're working, but are you working the number of hours you'd like to work? And if not, is that for economic reasons? Has the employer cut back hours, or you could only find part-time work, or is that because of personal reasons? And if people answer it's for economic reasons, the Bureau of Labor Statistics calculates a measure of underemployment where they add in everybody who's uh, unemployed, the official definition of unemployed, all those discouraged workers and people who are working fewer hours than what they would like to work. And that's what this chart shows you, this underemployment um, rate. So in September 2013, again, the most recent um, uh, sort of snapshot of the economy, the underemployment rate in the U.S. was 13.6 percent. Remember, the unemployment rate, 7.2 percent. So sort of a different, gives you a different sense of what's going on in terms of economic loss that um, households are experiencing when you think of this broader um, measure. And in fact, at the peak of this in 2009, we had an underemployment rate of over 17 percent that was 25 million individuals okay, that were underemployed. It was a number that Mitt Romney 
uh, used a lot in some of his campaign speeches, 25 million people out of work, but it was using this broader definition of uh, underemployment. Now what's interesting in this recession is that um, this category of individuals that were working part-time for economic reasons, we see that that really shot up uh, during this recession, much higher than the earlier recessions that I talked about, the ones in the early 80s, 90s, and, and 2001. And here, I think what we see is that employers were certainly not bashful about laying off workers as the recession unfolded. But they were also very aggressive with respect to changes in hours. And for uh, those of us you know, that look at um, how employers organize work, what we, we do see is that there have been many changes that have been put in place. It's partly a reflection of the nature of what people are doing at work, the movement away from uh, manufacturing into the service sector, but also sort of flexibility in hours of work, scheduling of work over the course of the week. So we see um, employers moving on this margin uh, more than probably was the case in, in the past. And it's probably reflective of changing composition of, of work and changing organizational structures that employers um, have put in, in place. Um, I do want to point out, because it's something that gets talked about a lot in the context of the um, Accountable Care Act, uh, that the percentage of people in part-time work has been dropping very dramatically. Um, in uh, recent years, since um, 2012. So a lot of people are saying, oh, there's been a big uptick in people that are working part-time as employers switch them to part-time status from full-time status. It's certainly not to say that that's not happening, but when you look at the data all in, what we're seeing is a decrease in the number of people working part-time for economic reasons. And a lot of us you know, that look at um, the monthly employment reports, this is one of the first numbers that I look at when the employment release comes out, because it gives you a sense not only, you know, you know, the employment, the headline numbers, the employment numbers and unemployment rate are, are fine, but as that part-time employment number goes down, that means that employers are starting to crank up hours, and this is sort of a, viewed as a good sign that um, they're going to be bringing in uh, more workers uh, into the workplace. So another characteristic of this recession that's quite different from earlier ones um, is what's happened to the labor force uh, participation rate. So this is a measure that takes everybody who's unemployed or employed, that's sort of the numerator, and it divide it by the population. So in this case, this is looking at the population in the United States of everybody who's over the age of 16, and what fraction of that population is either unemployed or employed. So you see back in um, 1980, it was about 63.5%. Uh, it peaked uh, just before 2000 at over 67%. And it's been kind of like dropping like a stone uh, ever, ever since then. So, um, in fact, in the most recent report, we had the labor force participation rate was down at 63.2%. That's the lowest level since 1978. So what's going on here in this economy that we, we have this uh, big change in, in labor force participation? And it's interesting because the when you look from the 1980s into um, the end of the 1990s, we saw this big increase in labor force participation, in large part driven by increasing participation of women. So we had these big gains in the labor market as women entered in increasing numbers into employment. And pretty much all of those gains that we saw for women coming into the labor market have disappeared uh, in the most, over the period since uh, 2000. So what does that mean about what's happening in the workforce? Well, one of the other big changes that's happened demographically, um, and you know, there are those that say de demography is destiny, um, we're aging as a society. Um, so maybe as a higher fraction of the population that's over the age of 16 is reaching retirement age, what we're seeing with this falling labor force participation rate is a composition issue, that more people are older and older people have lower labor force participation rates. So that might be um, what's happening. First of the baby boomers turned uh, 62 in 2008, and um, 
at which they could begin to collect Social Security. It's, it's a reduced amount for, for Social Security. Although I'll note that you know, this change in labor force participation rate and that decline um, started even before 2008. So this, you know, some of it is aging, but there's other things going on as well in terms of labor force uh, participation um, rate. So let me um, look at another measure that economists look at. So it's like I'm a data vampire, so there's not a number that I don't want to have you know, some fun with uh, here. Um, that is a joke, you can laugh. Um, so this is uh, employment rates. So these, this is um, looking at the population and just looking at the share of the population that's employed. So say, say you don't really like the way the Bureau of Labor Statistics defines unemployment, you think it's too narrow or whatever, so fine, so ignore you know, that measure, and you say, what I really want to know is what fraction of people have a job. So here's um, a, a look at what's been happening to employment rates, but div dividing it by um, age groups. And it's really quite stunning, and I'm starting at 2000, because that's where we see this big decline in labor force uh, participation rate. So what, what's going on? Let's kind of get inside of that a little bit. So you see that um, the group that's experienced a big contraction in their employment share are 16 to 19 year olds. It's really quite stunning. So in 2000, like 45% of 16 to 19 year olds were in employment. And by 2013, it's just a little bit more than a quarter of 16 to 19 year olds. Now, some of that might actually be a good thing. And we do know that um, we see, um, 70% of high school graduates are enrolling in college or university, so, and that's you know, been rising uh, dramatically. So if the reason why they're not in employment is because they're full-time schooling, that could be a good thing. But we also know that there's a very large number of young people that are not in school or not in work, so disenfranchised uh, youth. It's about six million or, or more different calculations of, of how many young people are in that category. So what the heck are they doing? And as a parent of somebody in that age range, you know, I'm, this is something I, I um, worry about a lot, but we've had this big contraction in um, employment by the youngest uh, of our, our labor market. So what one explanation of that decline in labor force participation rate is that people are delaying entry into the labor market. It may be because they can't find any jobs. That's pretty bad. It may be because they're going into education. That could be good. You want to worry about the value of the education, make sure they're making uh, good choices, everybody uh, going to Cornell. Um, but uh, that's been a, a, a significant change. Same thing you see 20 to 24 year olds, again, a big contraction in the percentage of them in employment. Employment number is much higher um, than uh, for the younger group. But now look at the um, older end of the distribution. So when you look at people age 65 to 69 or 70 to 74, you see big increases in the fraction of those workers employed. But wait a second, that doesn't make sense. I thought the whole reason why labor force participation was falling is because people are getting older. Well note though that for both 65 to 69 year olds and 70 to 74 year olds, the fraction of people in employment is very low. So in 2000, it was about a quarter of people that were age 65 to 69. In 2013, it's uh, about 31%. So it's a big increase, but it's coming off of a small base. Or for 70 to 74 year olds, it's increased, but you know, in 2013, it's like 19%. So there's been a change that old, more older workers, the share of older workers in employment has been rising. But as you jump, as you become older, the probability that you're in employment drops dramatically. So this composition effect um, is quite important in thinking about um, what's happening to the labor force participation rate. But it's an area where um, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting work still to be done to try to understand both what's happening now and more importantly, projecting what's going forward. What's going to happen to labor force participation rates for the youngest of, of our economy, as the economy improves, will more people start going back into the labor market? 
and for the oldest in, workers in our society, has the impact of the recession been such that they've wiped out wealth, they don't have um, uh, retirement income to live on, so more and more people are going to stay in employment for a longer period of time. And with more education and better health, people don't want to stop uh, working. Certainly as a dean, one of the things that I face all the time is trying to encourage some of my uh, more, say, mature faculty members to consider um, a graceful exit um, to provide some more room for younger faculty members uh, to come in to, um, into the school. But they are contributing, they're writing uh, papers and they're uh, teaching lectures. So um, a lot of that um, uh, change in uh, labor force participation is actually a good, a good thing of people having more opportunities to work productive lives uh, longer. So a couple other things, and then I'll start talking about policy uh, that are different about uh, this recession. So here I've mapped uh, the unemployment rate that's in the uh, sort of violet color, and um, the share of people that have been out of work for uh, six months or more. And you know those two series in the past tended to move together. So as the unemployment rate went up, people in long spells, you know, the fraction of people in, in long spells of unemployment would go up. It kind of makes sense. But we see in this recession, the fraction of people in long-term unemployment really shot up relative even to the increase um, in the uh, unemployment rate. And that's gotten a lot of folks to talk about whether or not we're now experiencing what economists call structural unemployment, people that are sort of locked into this state of unemployment. Um, they've been in a long spell, their skills um, have declined, they've lost their networks uh, to get a job, maybe they've become discouraged, their health may have worsened from being out of work for a long period of time. Employers don't want to hire them because they'd much rather get a young person who hasn't experienced a long spell of unemployment. And that poses a real challenge because, you know, are we ever going to get back to the unemployment rate we had before the Great Recession um, started? And that unemployment rate was 4.4%. So um, are we stuck? Is the new normal this, um, as Dick was mentioning in his introduction, is it this new uh, higher rate of, of unemployment? And there's some really significant uh, consequences when you have sort of such high rates of unemployment for such a long period of time and this job creation taking, um, being so slow for the economy. For, for workers, you know, the longer you're unemployed, your human capital depreciates. You know, so your knowledge and understanding of the skills that you need for work um, do uh, decline. As I mentioned before, you lose your, your networks of where jobs are and your contacts, uh, your job search is less uh, uh, effective. We see evidence, and here actually it's kind of interesting, there's some mixed evidence of, about whether or not unemployment is good for your health or bad for your health. There's some studies that say it's like, you know, bring it on, it's great for your health, and other studies that say not. I think some of the difference there is how long that unemployment takes place and what your sense of options you are and where you are um, in terms of education and other skills. But, um, you know, there are issues of physical and mental health um, associated with long spells of, um, of unemployment. Um, job training can make a difference for uh, workers that have been out of work for a long period of time. But one of the ironies in, in the U.S. is that, at least at the federal level, when we have um, very high unemployment, that triggers increased funds for uh, job training. But as you saw, you know, like the, giving people job training, yet there are no jobs, doesn't really help you get into jobs. So when there are no jobs, we train people for jobs. And when there are jobs, we don't train people for jobs. So it's sort of a little... Uh, backwards. And states are certainly not doing any training because they actually have to balance their budgets so there's no money at the state level to uh, provide assistance for, for job training. So that, that means that workers that are feeling their human capital skill sets are depreciating have a difficult time in terms of getting training that's going to actually lead them uh, into employment. And as a result we see wages and household incomes stagnating or falling. 
for families more broadly, and this is something that at the Heller School for Social Policy, we spend a lot of time looking at the consequences of um, spells of uh, unemployment or loss of income for families, for kids in particular. Um, we see higher uh, poverty rates, and currently now in the United States, 15% of our population that's in, in poverty. We see uh, more households experiencing food uh, insecurity um, or uh, having difficulty in getting um, uh, access to uh, health care. Um, and you know, one of the tragedies of a long recession is that you have big cutbacks in state and in local uh, government revenues, and because they have to balance their, their budgets, they in turn reduce uh, government education funding. So at a time when we're telling everybody, you know, school is really important at the state and local level, um, education funding is, is being uh, reduced. So all of this all in means that this, we're having some real permanent consequences of this recession that are gonna have lasting effects even when we get um, all those jobs uh, uh, recovered uh, in, in, the, in the economy. Just one last one, just to kind of make you completely depressed. So here's median household income, what's happened to it um, since the early 1980s. So this is inflation adjusted, and you see that you know, through the 80s and 90s, up again to 2000, you had, you know, with some dips there reflecting uh, contraction of the economy, median household income uh, was uh, rising. It reached its peak in 1999 at $56,000. And then it's sort of either been stagnant or, or dropping since then, so that in 2012, median household income was down to $51,000. And that's the first time since the Great Depression that median household income adjusted for inflation hasn't risen for more than a decade. So this is, you know, all this is contributing to um, anxiety. And then just to keep it, um, this is a chart you probably saw, I'm sure Dick uh, Freeman probably showed you. So this is telling you something about what's happening um, to the top income decile uh, in the United States. So not everybody's having a bad time. So in the top 10% of um, income distribution in the United States, their income share, so how much of the total income in the United States did they have, it hit 50% um, in 2007. So the top 10% are getting 50% of the income. So that's good for them. Um, the last time we saw something that high, that, that kind of um, degree of inequality was just before the Great Depression. So we had high inequality before the Great Depression, then that um, uh, disappeared. We go through the period of the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the great sort of coming together in the United States. And then from 73 on, we seem to have been growing, uh, increasingly growing apart um, in, in this country. So we got a few challenges uh, in terms of thinking about uh, policy. Um, in, in the economy. On the macroeconomic front, we've got um, weak labor demand. We don't have sufficient job creation to really make a dent into that pool of unemployed and keep pace with the growth of um, uh, the size of the population. And you know, we're in a phase right now that uh, we're adding job destruction on the public sector side. Uh, as um, the sequester has kicked in and we run the risk of sequester two uh, coming into effect uh, in the beginning of uh, the new year, which will again decrease uh, public expenditures. We still have you know, this very high uh, unemployment associated with growth that is, um, you know, it's there, it's positive, but it's not high enough to really, um, again, make a dent in unemployment. We've got these high and persistent economic and social costs associated with uh, job loss for the long-term unemployed. And, and for youth in particular who are entering the labor market, um, it's very hard when you finish your schooling and you're entering the labor market and you just can't find anything. That's a critical period of time of uh, formation of sort of work ethics, social skills, et cetera. And to be out of work for such a period of time just as you're entering into the labor market 
um, has some permanent uh, consequences. Many of us looked at that issue back in the 1980s. That's what I first started doing my research on was um, the scarring effects of youth unemployment spells as youth are entering into a labor market with high unemployment. So uh, one worries about that going forward. And then we've got these sort of longer term structural issues of this increasing inequality. What's that about? Um, polarization of labor demand. So we see those with high skills doing better than those with low skills and what's happening in, in the middle. Uh, globalization and um, and uh, on the demographic front, we've got an aging society. And we have another uh, changing uh, characteristic of, of our society. By 2043, we'll have a majority minority population. And um, so what's happening to different groups in, in the economy for uh, African Americans, Hispanics? Um, what's happening in terms of their labor market experience and as they're moving into the majority uh, of our working age population. So uh, one last um, uh, sort of set of charts here. I think this is something you've probably seen before. Another interesting characteristic about our economy, it's not specific to the most recent recession. This goes back to 1973, is that We've had productivity growth in, in the economy. So we go in the economy, we continue to be able to produce uh, more output per, per labor um, hour but, or number of workers. But what's happened since 1973 is hourly compensation hasn't kept pace with that productivity uh, growth. Up until 1973, this is this period of growing together, as productivity increased, um, compensation increased with it. But after 1973, for whatever reason, and this is a big puzzle, the, the share going to labor of the increase in productivity seems to be declining. And um, so a lot of folks have uh, been worried about why that's happening. And I'm going to zoom in on even a more recent period of time. So this is starting in 1995, looking at productivity growth and looking at what's happened to um, wages, real wages for college graduates, the median worker, and for high school graduates. And even by skill level, you see that since 2000, even for college graduates, their compensation doesn't seem to be keeping pace with uh, productivity. So there's something that's sort of driving a wedge between historically what we had, this relationship between productivity and compensation. And that's not um, playing out. That's part of the explanation of why we see this uh, rising inequality, um, more of the gains in income going to a smaller uh, fraction of uh, the workforce. So why this deterioration? Well, the first one, and I think it's an important one, um, remember unions? Uh, they brought you the 40-hour work week and protection in a workplace and uh, negotiated for wages. Well, the decline of uh, unions has been uh, dramatic, in particular in the private um, sector. Um, and it's dramatic, not just, you know, its impact on those who were uh, working in a unionized establishment, but also when unionization rates were higher um, in the 60s uh, and 70s, even in those sectors that weren't unionized, you saw a spillover effect of the union um, negotiations on non-unionized workers. The sort of threat effect um, had a positive effect in terms of wages of, of workers. So who's watching and protecting workers in, in the workplace? Um, I mean, that's certainly part of the explanation of why we're seeing this widening gap between productivity and compensation. Um, when we look at uh, the nature of employment relations, one of the um, sort of striking features of, of the US uh, labor market um, has been the increasing use of uh, temporary workers. So firms have their core set of workers and then they will contract out using temporary workers who might be working side by side with core workers. You have subcontracting of functions, say custodians, food service workers, increasingly more professionalized skills, human resource management, payroll, um, legal affairs, accounting. And you have the increasing uh, use of uh, third-party um, managers. So 
um, the nature of the employer-employee relationship has really changed. There are a lot of, uh, the, there's more distance between the employer and the employee than was the case um, in, in the past. And I think this affects norms for wage setting. Um, it means that in the old sort of more paternalistic uh, firm that uh, firms took care of their workers because they were there, they were living side by side them in communities, they knew those workers were going to be buying their goods. There was a sense of we're all in this together and, and a you know, rising tide will raise all boats. But as that relationship has become uh, more distant, um, there's not that same sense of obligation of, of sharing the quote unquote rents or uh, profits uh, with, with workers in terms of uh, higher wages. Certainly in the midst of a recession, uh, vulnerable workers are unlikely uh, to step forward and demand increased uh, wages. Um, and in particular, if you look at uh, undocumented workers in certain sectors of the economy, uh, maybe the uh, food, eating, and drinking establishments in the hospitality sector, uh, there's some real worries about um, what that means in terms of wages more broadly uh, within those uh, sectors. Where people work has certainly changed over time. The traditional factory model, what I grew up with as a kid with the brass industry is certainly um, disappearing. We don't have people working in large uh, manufacturing establishments with stable workforces, training programs in place to move people up from unskilled to semi-skilled jobs. Um, you know, the uh, Walmart has replaced General Motors as uh, the largest um, employer. And um, where people work, you're in sort of smaller units. So again, it's hard for you to kind of organize and, and feel that you have some capacity to influence um, your wages. Changing technology and uh, work design has made it more difficult to track the number of hours that are, are worked. So for example, when people are doing work both on-site and off-site, working at home uh, on com computers outside of usual hours, um, this has posed some real challenges with respect to regulating the labor market under the Fair Labor and Standards um, Act. And finally, um, underfunded enforcement has meant that um, for people that are engaged in the enforcement of uh, minimum wages, of paying overtime for workers, um, of making sure that workers are not misclassified and uh, being viewed as being exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act, those that are investigating these claims often feel like they're on a hamster wheel. They're running faster and faster to try to fix things uh, in the labor market, but they're not able to make uh, real progress with respect to protecting workers and in turn then workers' earnings uh, suffer. So what would Frances uh, Perkins do? Well, a little bit of that is informed by what she and FDR did do at the time during um, the Great Depression. Uh, first thing, uh, she probably would be arguing for more government support, um, not less. Uh, she wouldn't be cutting food stamps, dropping the extension of unemployment insurance beyond 26 weeks. Um, she'd be jawboning with, with employers on adding employees. And in fact, it was interesting, I mean, FDR in the height of the Great Depression would call employers into the White House and, you know, basically browbeat them into making employment commitments of how many jobs they were going to add. So what happened in this time round? Well, we got an employment czar uh, who was supposed to do that, but, you know, it's, Employers today, they're different than the, what employers were back in the 1930s. These are increasingly global companies. They, it's harder to kind of make that patriotic argument, sort of ra everybody wrap themselves in the flag and say, you know, you're doing this for America. This is your patriotic duty to um, uh, hire, hire U.S. workers. If employers aren't feeling that kind of state tie, um, it, it's, the job owning is, is more difficult. And, uh, but it, it doesn't mean you shouldn't still try uh, to do it. And certainly um, at a time where there's no shortage of need to invest in roads, bridges, and airports, um, dare I um, say another round of stimulus might be handy to have, um, but that doesn't seem to be the direction in which our political uh, debate is, is moving. In terms of support for the, for the unemployed, um, 
here the, the long-term you know, states have really um, gone to the wall with respect to funding their unemployment insurance uh, programs. They've um, borrowed, um, uh, increased their borrowing in the state trust funds and have really, we have a crisis unfolding in terms of unemployment insurance. And um, that crisis is particularly worrying because, you know, we're six years into the recovery and we still are down in terms of employment. You know, one way to look at this is, yeah, we're six years into the recovery. Another way to look at it is, gee, we seem to get a recession about every decade. So we're getting closer and closer to probably another contraction in the economy for whatever reason. What's going to be the capacity of our unemployment insurance system to actually deal with another contraction anytime soon? given what's happened um, to the trust fund. So that's, you know, that's something that needs some support um, and attention uh, to. Other countries, and in, in, in whenever you're thinking about what you should do for unemployment today, you should also be thinking about unemployment in the future, because we will have another recession. We will have another major contraction in the economy. I hope it's not anything like what we just experienced. But we will, we, it will happen. So what are we putting in place to anticipate that and to try to smooth the, the negative effects of that on individuals and families and, 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 and households? So um, you know, one proposal has been to try to be more explicit with respect to work sharing. This is something that we've seen um, uh, used in, in Europe, in Germany in particular. It seems to have worked at least for Germany in the most recent recession to have minimize the displacement effects of the recession. Their unemployment rate is lower. Um, there have been states in the United States that have um, tried to implement some types of, of work sharing and using the unemployment insurance system to help uh, fund this. Um, but it's not really been taken up uh, very much in the United States. So maybe Frances Perkins would be going around doing some jawboning on, on that side. She certainly would probably be supporting an increase in the minimum wage and maintaining their earned income uh, tax uh, credit uh, program. And um, in terms of employment and training programs, I would expect that she would be very involved um, about expanding employment and training um, uh, programs. Um, but here, we really need to make sure that we're getting training to workers that's associated with actual jobs um, and um, uh, so that people are investing in, in that skills training uh, for something that, that works. And one of the challenges is as the economy improves and people are, are working uh, more hours is that people with low skills have both a skills deficit and a time deficit. So they, they, they know they need to get more skills training, but if you're working more hours to be able to get the income you need to support your family, you don't have time to do training. So again, for training, you probably need to do both training and some type of income support to really make a difference in terms of moving people up uh, the skill, uh, skill ladder. And finally, um, Specific populations are going to have different types of, of uh, needs, and policy needs to be shaped for those different populations. For older workers that are experiencing long-term unemployment, for disenfranchised youth, for those who are in the prison system, for students with disability transiting from uh, high school into the workplace, and for the increasing numbers of veterans coming back into civilian workforce. So no one policy is likely to meet the needs of each of these different uh, demo demographic um, uh, groups. And I would argue, uh, you know, uh, a couple of other things that are important in thinking about the Fair Labor Standards Act itself, that it's, you know, well past time for reforming the Fair Labor Standards Act. And we, what we really need is an FLSA for the 21st um, century. Part of that is to think about who's actually covered by this act and who's not. And that's this, what, this language of being an exempt or non-exempt uh, worker. So you're not covered by the Fair Labor Standards Act if you're in a supervisory uh, role. And um, uh, unless you have a really low income, that then that means, yeah, you might have a supervisory role, but your, your income um, is really low. And that income cutoff right now is $23,000 a year. That's a really low income cutoff. 
So you know, some people have said, well, you know, workers that need um, protection under the Fair Labor Standards Act, they, it shouldn't be you're in or out of the act on the basis of what your salary, your supervisory responsibilities are. Maybe it should be your salary. Maybe if you're making, you know, less than median wages, fifty-one thousand dollars a year or something like that, maybe you should be covered by the Fair Labor Standards Act. So um, I think that's one area that would be good to look at. And for those of you looking at FLSA, the issue of who is exempt or non-exempt, I think, is a big one. Um, misclassification of workers uh, is really important. So we um, see increasingly um, employees that are being called something other than an employee. They're being called an independent contractor. Um, and they're often denied uh, access to benefits and protections, such as family and medical leave, overtime, minimum wages, and unemployment insurance, to which they're actually entitled to. Um, and so that's something that needs to be addressed. The extension of FLSA to uh, more workers, um, you know, the recent decision to extend FLSA to coverage for home health aid. So people that are working in the home taking care of um, uh, aging parents or uh, disabled family members, now they're covered under FLSA. Um, and it's interesting, um, the expansion uh, of FLSA to home health um, workers, I think it reflects also uh, changing notions socially uh, of, of this occupational class. It's sort of a recognition that there is an occupational category of home health uh, aides. And the, it's not like a new category. We always had home health aides. They were called daughters in the past, okay? Or sisters or, or aunts or relatives that took care of people in the family. But now there's a recognition that no, these are individuals that are getting paid, deserve to have um, protection, and um, to be pay, paid a, a, a fair wage. So FLSA needs to understand this sort of changing uh, social construct in which um, it's being uh, applied. And then I've already sort of talked about um, enforcement is, is a critical um, issue. So let me conclude on the following. So there's plenty of discussion in Washington about deficits, you know, the fiscal deficit, we got to get that under control, we got to, you, know, you know, contract government spending because we're denying the future to our children. But I'd argue that um, we have a more pressing uh, deficit, um, and that's our opportunity deficit. That's the 8 million net new jobs that we need to have in the economy to get ourselves back where we were before uh, this recession began. It's a question of uh, the provision of decent work for individuals that are, are in the workplace or working full time or, or part time that they have appropriate paying benefits and working conditions and training opportunities to be able to advance themselves and that are commiserate with the um, improvements in productivity that they've brought about. We have 46 million people living in poverty in the United States and Living in poverty is associated with all kinds of um, uh, negative um, outcomes for, for those individuals, and in particular for children that are living in uh, poor um, households. We have you know, really unacceptable disparities for kids in access to quality early childhood uh, care. We have 43% of black and Latino kids attending schools with poverty rates of 80% or more and only 4% of white kids in attending schools with poverty rates of 80% or more. So we are still a very racially divided um, society with respect to that most important um, investment in human capital of schools. And I think we had, you know, many of us had this dream that education would be the, the great opportunity that would bring our society uh, together um, and provide a more, um, uh, balanced in a more equal opportunity across the society, but it's just not playing out that way. So that's a uh, part of our opportunity um, deficit. And then we have this uh, aging infrastructure in the United States that um, of bridges and, and roads and, and airports um, that really holds back our capacity uh, to innovate and, and grow. So. I think it's time that we try to have uh, engagement um, with a new social compact between business, 
labor in government. And I have to say, um, it's, I've been somewhat heartened in, in watching some of the discourse associated with the most recent um, round of the government shutdown and the almost uh, uh, debt default, that business that has been quiet for so long finally seems to be speaking up and saying, you know, this is really not good for anybody. Um, this kind of uh, uh, running, lurching from crisis to crisis. It's, un it's, it's uh, destabilizing and it's, it's holding back um, growth um, in, in the country. We used to have that discussion, that dialogue between business, labor, and government. And I think especially you know, being here at Cornell with the ILR school, I mean, that was a characteristic of, of uh, the education um, here at Cornell. And uh, I think unless we can decide collectively as, as a country that we need to come together across these three front fronts and that all of our fortunes are, are intimately tied um, together, um, I fear for our capacity to actually recover from the Great Recession. So stop there. Well, uh, Professor Lynch would be glad to call on people. Uh, the one thing that I remind you of is that although this is a rather good auditorium for your hearing, those of us in the front, it's hard for people in the audience to hear one another. So would you speak up? that we see in income and wages is also, you know, it happens in our schools as well. So the numbers that you um, detailed, what's, what I find when you look then by different groups, um, so there are other, you know, all the other t sort of test scores. Um, so Massachusetts, for example, does incredibly, we do really well on that. And the state you know, governor was out heralding the fact that we were, in Massachusetts on some, you know, international comparative standard our youth were doing, as well as youth in other countries at grade eight. And then, meanwhile, within the state, we see enormous disparities in terms of how different school districts and kids in those districts do. So what we have in the country, we have, you know, very unequal opportunities with respect to education. And so what those larger surveys show is sort of all in. What we're doing for the average kids on this, we're, we're, we're not serving our, 
our children. I completely agree with you. I think our, our future um, is very much at risk because of our failure to really provide that equal access of opportunity in education. Uh, I, let me disagree. If equal access to a mediocre curriculum, it does not really demand high achievement of students in high school. Even, I mean, certainly a place like Ithaca, where, what, 25% of the children in, 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 in local high school are the children of college professors and staff at the two universities. Um, it, we're a totally unique situation. But everywhere else in, in, in the United States, just about, except for Scarsdale, and we could list about 100 communities around the country, things are really pretty terrible in terms of the standards that schools expect ch children to achieve and that the children and their parents expect the kids to achieve. So John, I'm going to turn it back to you. So what would you do to, uh, to sort of address it when we have an educational system, as you know, which is highly decentralized, it's driven by, you know, local, not even at this state, let alone the federal, um, local decisions. So how, how do you turn that around from a policy point of view? No, I, yeah, and I think, and it's interesting as, um, you know, that, that tension, in, in a lot of those other countries that you mentioned, you know, they have a national strategy with respect to investment in education, and a lot of debate and discussion about the standards and curriculum that, that you need to have in place. In the past, people said, well, you know, but in the U.S. it's different because we have a much more heterogeneous population, and that's why it's difficult. But you see countries that you rattled off that even in those countries that have a very heterogeneous population, they're able to do a better job. So I completely agree with you. But we have a system, you know, such a decentralized system with respect to education that it's hard to kind of push that lever. I mean, the race to the top was meant to provide some carrots to get school systems to undertake some reforms and to raise the, the stakes. But it's a kind of a blunt and weak instrument. It was something. Um, but it does not provide, you know, a lot of, a lot of states didn't want to even compete for that. So um, that's kind of, it is a challenge for us with our highly centralized system. Yeah. You said we could use more stimulus, and you mentioned infrastructure, and then you said that the political debate doesn't seem to be headed in that direction. No, we're just asking. Uh, it, it seems that uh, it would be helpful if, if more of us spoke out sharply about that. I mean, I think the, the infrastructure issue is to ought to be totally non-controversial. There are many roads and bridges that you point out that need to be fixed. If we wait to fix them, they'll cost much more in the future, even if we neglect the yeah. unemployment situation. But there are right now people who know how to fix them who aren't working. We can hire people to fix roads and bridges now at essentially zero cost and save the big bills that we would have right. to pay for those same jobs in the future. But the fact that we're not doing that bespeaks a level of political malfeasance that I think uh, just has to be called out more sharply. Well, and you know, I, yeah. <laughs> amen to that. Um, you know, back even to John, your listing of those countries when you're talking about education. If you were to look at those countries also in terms of what they're spending on infrastructure, if you look at high speed rail, at um, internet connection, connectivity, et cetera, they have leap ahead of where we are in the United States. So, you know, part of the reason why they're also doing a better job with technology is because they need to get these folks that are able to work in this new environment. So there's a commitment from those states to that investment, both on the education side and on the infrastructure. But um, I completely agree with you. I think um, voices have been rather silent. And you know, just because one group of people says that, you know, well, this is what we're gonna do. We have to you know, safeguard the future of our children by further cutting uh, government expenditures. I think, you know, it's, People should say, well, no, I want to safeguard the future of my children by investing in schools, by raising the, the standards and um, expectations and, uh, of what they're going to do in the schools, by investing in the infrastructure. Larry. Uh, there was a period in, in the U.S. in the late 1990s when unemployment got very low. Yep. Real wages were rising. Yep. And it, it was about a five-year period. Year term, the beginning of a coincided with year term. <laughs> 
Yes, I, I'd like to single-handedly take credit for that. So I guess my question is, 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 is there anything we can learn from that now, from the perspective of 2013, that really seemingly golden period of, of rising wages and low unemployment that, that would be applicable? So it's interesting because I remember when I um, joined the Labor Department in 1995, people were talking about this slow recovery, which I showed you the charts of that. Slow recovery, um, I remember going to a um, meeting at the OECD where Europeans were saying, oh, you know, you Americans, the jobs you're creating, they're terrible jobs, they're just hamburger flipping jobs. And um, in fact, The Economist had a front page cover story saying all the jobs are at the low wage. Uh, part of the um, income distribution as we were gaining jobs of 200, 250,000 new jobs uh, every month. But what was interesting is that then as, as that continued, you did see that pressure of you know, more employers starting to reach into pools of uh, workers that they wouldn't have historically um, reached into for uh, to hire people and to do training for those individuals. So there's nothing like a, a hot labor market that gets um, employers reaching out. But what was striking is that then when we hit the recession of 2001, we saw that pulling back. And I think what employers have been doing is finding other ways that they can kind of do a workaround on that. And it's, you know, investments in technology, it's, it's so replacing a person with a machine or going overseas for the task. And, and so I think that's the structural issue that's happening, that a hot labor market doesn't seem to be sufficient. Where hot is you know, GDP growing at, at a good pace doesn't seem to be sufficient to pull into the labor market people that are you know, stuck on the periphery. And certainly right now, in terms of the recovery right now, we, we are not experiencing you know, GDP growth of 3 or 4% that would create even those conditions. Um, so I think you both need to have um, a rapidly growing economy, and there's issues about how employers are thinking about organizing the workplace that are sort of working against the most disadvantaged. Yeah. Well, maybe this is the next step because it's sort of an invitation to talk some more about the long-term structural questions that you uh, uh, scared us with. Scared me anyway. So there's a very long-term trend of gains of uh, technological improvement <coughs> the capital versus yeah. enormously uh, striking where the productivity gains are going. Uh, new trend of stagnation. Uh, uh, in median household income, uh, uh, what we expect related to the, the first yeah. in, a, in a country in which the basic poverty rate doesn't change much. So there, there well, it did. It had gotten lower. I mean, we made progress on poverty, and then we're going back. Right. I mean, in, in, in the last the last several years mm -hmm. since the change from mm -hmm. uh, uh, the war the war on poverty mm -hmm. uh, trend. Uh, more and more long-term unemployment coming out of recessions. Is there, I'm sure there are a lot of causes. Do you think there's a major underlying cause? Do you think there's a major underlying cure? So, I, I, would it so, so I think that we suffer, um, you know, I, uh, uh, we, I, I'm using the we sort of I think in the U.S., but I think it can be broader. I think we, we suffer a problem that we're always looking for the one single thing that really is the problem. And if we could just go and fix that one thing, then everything would be good again. So, you know, in the context of thinking about long-term unemployment, et cetera, so there, there are a list of suspects that people have pointed to, sort of the stagnating wages and higher unemployment. And it's, you know, from the decline of unions to weakening government regulation of the labor force, which also includes a sort of falling real value of the minimum wage, 
to globalization, to technology hollowing out the middle of the income distribution, to what um, my friend David Weil calls the fissuring of the labor market, this sort of distancing of relationships between employers and employees that makes it easier for an employer to kind of keep the profits all to themselves and not share that uh, more broadly with the workforce. So all of these things, though, or, or, and the you know, failure of training programs to keep pace with the kinds of skills that, that workers uh, need to have. So all of those things are happening, and there are different policies that you would put in place to address each one of them. I think what's interesting when you take a comparative um, perspective, back to the point that you raised, John, with talking about comparative data on education, there are choices that we make in, in our society. There are choices we make about what we invest in in our schools, where we invest that. There are choices that we make with respect to the amount of social supports that we put in place, the choices that we make with respect to how much of government expenditures we put into expending on wars versus uh, expenditures on, on people. And those choices result in different outcomes because the outcomes that we see in the United States are not the exact same outcomes that are seen in other countries. There's a lot of variation when you look across um, countries. There's some countries that have, you know, I, I wouldn't trade our, our labor market because they're just too rigid, but there are other countries that have seem to have, and I would say the thing that is common in those countries that are doing better than the U.S. on, on the labor front is that there is a dialogue that's going on across the major stakeholders, business, labor, and government. And there is, it doesn't mean that they're all holding hands and singing kumbaya and going, oh yeah, what can I do for you today? But it does mean that people are coming to the table and recognizing that it's in their shared interest to talk with one another and find solutions, joint solutions, that will both enhance the productivity of the employers and wages of workers. So without that social compact, I fear that we're on a path where we will, our future is going to be long, you know, swaths of our economy that are just going to be stuck in long spells of unemployment um, and not um, have much of a future. So without that social compact, I don't see how we go forward. <laughs>